All right, good morning, everybody. So glad you're here. So um, the world and the people in it will never be perfect on this side of heaven. And we will always suffer from differences of opinion and disagreements that cause conflict and disunity. But as we'll explore today, Jesus came to redeem even the hardest and most difficult of relationships. So let's start with prayer and then we'll introduce ourselves. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence today here with us. Open our hearts today as we learn about what you have done for us through the life and work of Jesus. Help us to see the things that keep us disconnected from you and find peace in knowing that your great reconciliation work is already done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's go around and introduce ourselves. I'm Vicki Rockhold. Stan Jacobson. Nancy Jacobson. Karen Hines. Jean Anderson. Tom McCullough. Ruth Brown. I'm John Hutchison. Arnett Hansel. Matt Paul. Welcome, welcome, and welcome anybody at home. So, reconciliation atonement. This approach, and I'm reading from page 68, my book here. This approach to describing the significance of the cross suggests that our wayward behavior and our sinful state have caused a breach, a chasm, a divide in our relationship with God. As a result, we aren't able to hear God clearly, as if static has interfered with our reception of and our ability to listen to God's voice. We aren't able to know God's will for us, as if a dizziness in our spirit has ruined our attentiveness to God. And we aren't able to see who we are created to be, as if we are staring at ourselves in a funhouse mirror. Any thoughts on that little passage that you'd like to share? Does it ever feel like there's static interfering with your relationship with God or something getting in the way? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, she goes on later, he goes on later to talk about um, that it's hard uh, for us to sit and listen. I mean, I can talk to God a bit, right? If I'm by myself, but I don't stop to uh, uh, um, to listen. Yes. Me too. <laughs> and just, and all the other busyness of life. Right. Yeah. Just stopping to listen and letting things come in is difficult for me. There are lots of opinions about things in the world. And it just, you know, everybody has their opinion about this, that, or, or the other that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to hear what. God really wants us to be listening to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that also connects with the idea that of this of this chapter that that is through relationships with people that um, is one of the big sort of driving driving forces or paths to our reconciliation with God and to live out God's will. And so, if we're making our judgments and opinions that can be divisive between us and others. It's not that opinions are bad, but I think like you've been doing this month, this season of Lent, we have to look at whether we're judging and putting labels. I love that in your sermon today. <laughs> putting labels on things and judgments that, that can stick. I'm not against boy, you know, different opinions because you can learn from lots of different opinions. And I kind of enjoy the diversity of uh, it. Good point, right? Okay, good. All right, so let's take a look at um, this understanding's definition of sin and salvation, which is on page 84.
Would someone like to read those out loud? Page 84. Definition of sin. Sin separates us from God and each other. It tears us at the fabric of, of our relationships and renders us isolated and divided. Definition of salvation. Jesus bridges that gap and enables us to live in a full and free relationship with God and other people. The cross tears down the walls and brings us together to be healed as well as to be heal, healing agents for others. Thank so, you. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. No, nope. we'll let someone okay. else do it. Okay, prayers. Okay. Is the issue relate, relatable metaphor for anyone who feels alienated from God or estranged from someone else? It is also relevant to the decisiveness and astrology cons. To claim we have a broken relationship, God might suggest, God's distance or absence from us, which undermines our belief, and God's imminence and proximity to Jesus' response. We are called to be reconciled agents of God's love for others, overwhelming the problems that exist in our culture and renew the world that's full of our traditions. Thank you, John. Right. Okay, so if there's, if there's anything we learn about God throughout the Bible, is that God desires to be in relationship with us. From the very beginning, God created human beings for relationship with God and also with each other. And when sin entered into the world, that perfect unfettered union with God was broken. And we need someone to mend the relationship that sin has broken, and that person is Jesus. So on page 69 in our books, we have Colossians. One, verse 22, 21 and 22. So it says, Paul described the reconciling work of Jesus to the Colossians, reminding them and us that the source of our separation from God is our sins. Would someone like to read that? These verses from Colossians there. Once you're alienated from God, and you were enemies with him in your minds, which was shown by your evil actions. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you before God as a people who are holy, faultless, and without the land. Okay, thank you. So Paul describes sin in a stark term as evil. Do you tend to think of your own sin in this way? If all sin is evil. What if it's a very small sin? <laughs> Probably not. I, not evil. <laughs> That's a word for other people's stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So the author has this story about a time when that hook, he lost the hook that he was trying to attach to fishing line for his dad. And it, and it just that, that one thing disrupted his life so much, right? Have you had that happen? Have you witnessed a seemingly small sin disrupt your life or somebody else's life to the point that you were just complete? Or they were sort of just thrown off by it? I was very puzzled by why this was in there. It just, <laughs> everything's going along fine when you have Bible verses and Paul's talking, and all of a sudden we have a fishing hook. It just doesn't seem to connect for me with anything. It's, it's like a different author came in and wrote this chapter. <laughs> you know, I, I will, maybe not along that same line, I did notice it was a little bit different yeah. in this chapter because. The others, it seemed like there was a part where we went to the kind of the cons of it, right? Did you pick that up? And then and there wasn't anything on that here. I, I'm not a problem with it necessarily, but it just kind of stood out to me. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah you know, I, I, as I 
looked at that image though of the fishing hook, I was thinking of, you know, if you ever break a glass in your like in your kitchen, you know, we walk around barefoot a lot, you know, and uh, so you know when that happens and you're looking every last little place to um, you know to make sure you've gotten everything. And I had that happen actually just a few weeks ago. I had the tempered glass in your refrigerator. I was cleaning out the refrigerator and like doing it really thoroughly and I had this big piece of glass that it just slipped a little bit and tempered glass breaks nicely into all these little teeny pieces to make it safer, I guess, so it doesn't splinter so much. And there's glass oh. everywhere though, it just, it, you know, so yeah, I, it, yeah, I guess in that way, you know, understanding how the multitude of these little things can add up, um, you know, in terms of, you know, disruption. I, I thought from that standpoint, it was, a, it was a good illustration that we might not think of something as evil necessarily, but um, when things compound. I but guess. sometimes there's something that you get so focused on that you can't see God. <laughs> You're all worried about maybe it's some political thing or how somebody's acting or something. And you know, it takes away from being connected and listening to what God is saying. Yeah. I think um, for me, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, rem I'm reminded of that verse that, um, you know, uh, don't get so focused on the log in the other person's, or, or the, the, the speck in the other person's eye, you know, uh, look at look at your own um, look at your own eye for the walk or whatever, and um, uh, yeah. So a prayer that um, I would want to have um, is okay, God. So show me, show me my sin, because sometimes I think for me anyway, I, I'm just really unconscious of uh, and I just think that. You're sort of praying that same prayer if you want, Matt, um, asking that God show you where you're. Yeah, I think that's an important prayer. Easy to see some else's faults. So, Nancy, I will say that for me, the hook story, I kept, I kept looking well, where he's talking about sin, and then all of a sudden we're talking about this hook, and I was like, well, where's this? Is there going to be a sin something yeah. going on? Yeah. Maybe that's what yeah. threw me too. Yeah. Like, well, it's just a little accident. It's a mistake. <laughs> um, but then on page 71, um, I thought it kind of came back to me, started to make sense where it, when he gives up. Yeah. Near the bottom half of the page. You know, he gave up, he surrendered. That's that surrendered words like, okay. And then I could relate it to, I just give up. I give it to God. You know, it doesn't say those words, but that's what I thought might be behind that. Just I give up. And then all of a sudden he's able to find it and see. Yeah. When you think about this part on the bottom of 71, you cannot repair your broken relationship with God on your own. You cannot locate and conquer every little bit of sin in your life by yourself. And that's what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. And I remember your first name, Jean. 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 Um, we can't do that on our own, right? We can't pay for our sins or set our, ourselves free or earn, earn God's love or repair our separation from God. And then the author goes on on page 72 that that's an idea captured by Augustine, who describes the human condition as a wide gulf between us and God which can only be remedied by Jesus who bridges that gap. Do you think there's a wide gulf between us and God remedied by Jesus? For me, it feels like it ebbs and flows. Like sometimes there is no gap. I have no And I wouldn't necessarily call it a sin type of thing. I don't, for me, that that word, I, I have 
troubles with it because of some religious background that is that I've experienced where someone was put on me. So I, I try not, I, I, I have a hard time with that word. Um, but yeah, I would say for me, it ebbs and flows. It's not a constant state. So there's the author is saying here, we can't, and Augustine is saying, we can't bridge that gap between ourselves and God on our own. But, but I wonder, do, do we have a responsibility on that? That's, that's what I found in this. It seemed like nothing was up to us. <laughs> it didn't emphasize that very much. It emphasized, you know, it's all reconciled to, to Christ. But um, it seems like we have to have a part two. Or, or that would seem to be de emphasized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although he does go on to say somewhere, and someone will be able to find it. Um, uh, that <clears throat> we have the responsibility to live God's love into the into the world. And so um, it's not just that God's reconciled us and has built the bridge. We have to. There is there is definitely our side that um, God has made it possible. We have to. Um, we have to act it out. We have to get on that bridge. We have to walk across. We have to um, maintain that bridge. Um, so I. I and I'm not sure I'll be able to find that reference in here, but I'll Well, it's at 74, on page 74, it says, you know, grace is not cheap, even though you have not been saved by your good works, you have been saved to do good works, go. which I think is in, is that Corinthians or Ephesians? Um, the law is not saved you, but the holiness of God calls you to live a certain way in a way of love, a way of peace, in a way that transcends divisions between you and others, between you and God. All right, that, that's what I was Thank you. Yeah, and he used examples of reconciliation happening, you know, um, like false reconciliation required Ananias, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, and so, um, or that, uh, the illustration from the well, I guess based the movie based on this, the story of the the African American woman, and the KKK member, right, yeah. and the and that school board. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let's take a look at Ephesians, um, Ephesians two, verses eight through ten. Because Jesus, I'm going to read a little to that because Jesus reconciled God with humanity through the cross we can be agents for reconciliation with each other the Bible is filled with individuals and communities who sought to work through their divisions and were able to do so only through the power and grace of God a prominent example of the call for reconciliation can be found in the book of Ephesians where the major controversy in their community was Jew versus Gentile so Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Do you want to read that bit? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So how does Paul, in these words, level the playing field, so to speak, about who has earned the right to be a child of God? No one. Not you, not Gentile. It is by faith, not works. Right. It's the gift of God. Okay. It's by grace. Not necessarily by faith. Faith receives. Mm -hmm. 
that we're saved by grace, Paul says. Right. Which is always God's work. Mm -hmm. Well, in salvation, it's always God's work. Not that we can't be graceful. <laughs> right. In grace giving. <laughs> So when the message, this message was delivered by Paul, how do you think the Jews felt about this? And how do you think the Gentiles felt about this? They had to do some rethinking. <laughs> <laughs> Even more. <laughs> Must have sounded like heresy to them. Because for them, it was all about the law. And they were the chosen people. Right. Right. So what does this say about people who are not Christians? That's a good question. I mean, that's a huge question. That I've had. What about the Muslims that are, you know, the Buddhists? You got all those people that are on a spiritual path. What about them? I would say that the gift is available to all, regardless <coughs> of faith journey or lack of faith journey, if you want to call it. We all have to reach out to God. Uh, although his hand is outstretched to us, we have to reach him. And I think that's hard for a lot of people. Can I? I'm struggling with, with this completely. So if we read Galatians or Ephesians 2 1, it says you were dead through your trespasses and sins which you once lived. I've been around a few dead people and I've never seen a dead person reach out. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I was in a long conversation with a week ago Saturday with a Ugandan pastor um, who definitely holds that view. And he's Lutheran. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know what, I mean, this seems to say we can't do anything. Doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, if we're dead, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I struggled with it. So are we, I, the are only we way dead? I, that's what it says. That's what it says, that before we became Christian, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Um, so how do we become alive? Only by the work of the Holy Spirit working within us are, are we empowered to reach out. But that doesn't totally make sense either to me. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I struggle. I don't, I don't so have it, that answer. Like, well, verse 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, out yeah. of great love, right? Which he loved us. Yeah. He does it. Yeah. Not me. So, you know. Do you so, what's the, so the part of the, your struggle with is like, what is our role in, in yeah. receiving grace? Or? You know, especially in, in talking in depth uh, for a long time with, with a Ugandan pastor who has now become a Lutheran. Yeah. Um, He would say, definitely, we have a responsibility of reaching out. And it is not the work of the Spirit. It's, it's our responsibility. To reach out to God. To, to reach out God to God and accept God. To unlock the key to the door. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't think that's what Paul says here. I, I, don't, I, th I don't think it's possible for us to do it. It's what God does. But that doesn't really fit very well with American theology <laughs> that but, we, we want to do something. But Jesus said you have to open up the door. I I don't where does he say that? I stand at the door and knock. 
Yeah. Knock on the door. Yeah. So, and there's no handle on that door. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't. There's an interior handle. There's no exterior handle. At least the, the mm. picture that I was. Yeah, I don't try. Of. That's a picture. So, yeah. then, so then the person on the inside has to open. He hears the, the, the voice of God and he opens the door. But, but when you read Ephesians, how does it fit with this? Where it's, it says we're dead. It's a good question, but then we, we look at other places. In the, like last week, the, uh, the scripture reading that Pastor Matt gave, um, uh, um, truly I say to you, you know, which one, which one of these uh, were more deserving of the calamity they faced? Yeah, right. oh, yeah, yeah. um, truly I say to you, unless you repent, um, there, was, there would be no difference. It was like you would all face Very it. Decision. You know, there's the fundamental, one of the fundamental truths I think everyone can agree on is we're born into sin. We have no control over that. We, uh, by, it's an inheritance from Adam and Eve that we're going to make mistakes. We, we live in it. It's like a polluted environment. Um, but there also seems to be the call for repentance uh, all the way from, from John the Baptist to what Jesus said in that parable. And I, 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 I totally agree. With in other words, at right. least a recognition of our situation. But it's also, and, um, in, in John, uh, I think about 40, no, 50, 16, 17, somewhere in, no, can't be 17, 16. <clears throat> Jesus is saying the spirit, you know, he's talking about the spirit coming, will convict you of sin and of righteousness and judgment. It's not something that I do. It's something the Holy Spirit convicts me of. And then, then I respond. But it's because the Holy Spirit has been working on me. Um, I, you know, I, definitely there has to be a response in there. Sure. But it's because the Spirit has been working. You see, I, does, is it possible that being dead in our sins is... A function of our rejection of God, because I think in Romans Paul says something to effect. For since the creation of, of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that we were without excuse. So maybe, maybe the deadness comes from our rejection, because He goes on to talk in that chapter about turning people over to lawlessness and their self. So or maybe that's what makes us dead. Not that that makes us unhopeful, but we put up a barrier. But needs what to be reconciled? The question I have then is what changes that barrier? I agree with that. Yeah. But what do we have a part in changing that barrier of making that decision not to be uh, we have, rejected? I think we have a responsibility of awareness somehow. Yeah. However, and see that's what I struggle with. My my news it is, and we can kind of kill that. I mean, if if we are made in God's image and we have a sort of a natural inclination and we turn away from that, mm -hmm. that can result in deadness. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it does. Yeah. <laughs> it, I don't know. Is what you're describing is that particular to this? This theory of atonement, or is it it's know, more general? Know. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, well, it does. If okay, there's this gap. The the theory of atonement or the reconciliation says there's kind of a big gap there, mm -hmm. a chasm. What bridges that chasm? Is it? Does it have any part? Do I have any part in bridging that chasm? Or is it all what God has done? It sounds Calvinistic to me, what you're, how you're describing it. I'm not sure. I haven't studied Calvin that much, so I'm not sure what. That, the whole idea of being preordained. You're, oh, no. You're either mm -hmm. chosen or you're not chosen, is what I understand, but I'm not a scholar. Oh, no, I'm not saying that at all. Um, in fact, I would say instead, we're all chosen. 
but we have that possibility of rejecting it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, no, I, I'm not a, I'm not Calvin in that sense. I'm, I'm much more Lutheran <laughs> because Luther would say we have, we do not have the power to receive Christ, but we do have the power to reject Him. It is only the Holy Spirit who can give us the power to receive. So how do we become reconciled? What, uh, in human terms, how do we reconcile? Uh, to God? To each other. Oh, uh, I, that's a different issue, I think, to each other. But, but I totally think it could, it could still be utilized in how do we become reconciled to Jesus? I see those as different issues, so I, I don't know if I can answer that. I guess I, I don't, yeah. because, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I'm taking Oh, no. No, but it's a struggle. We're, 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 we're struggling with the issue. It's a struggle. Um, I think even in terms of my uh, relationships with people, um, I would still say I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. So it is, again, the power of the Spirit that allows me to reach out and to ask for forgiveness or to be reconciled with people. Uh, I, I, I look at that as God's work still within me. God is at work within me both to will and to do his good pleasure. In, in Philippians 2. Um, so I still look at that as God's work within me. That's part of well, sanctification, part of the growth. Philippians 2. Would you mind, or somebody read that for us? So or read what? Philippians 2. Philippians 2 says, For God is at work within us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. And then it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work within you, both the willing to do his good pleasure. And I, I think it's 2.13 or something. I don't know what the verse is. I'm going to have to read that. Um, yeah. So it does say, you know, work out your own self. It's an interesting paradox there. On one hand, it says, work out your own salvation. But it also says, God is at work within you, too. So... Um, I fall down upon the fact that God is at work within me to allow me to work out salvation. You know, what's, what's interesting, I think, is that um, a couple weeks ago you were talking about uh, was that there's um, about grace and that if there's anything that's dependent upon us, then it's no longer what Christ has done, something along mm -hmm. that line. Yeah. So now it feels like you're kind of going out from the other end of it. Like, but how do we participate in, in that if, you know, if there's nothing I, I mean it's it's I'm, I'm just saying it's a mis it's it is kind of a mystery I think one thing that stood out for me maybe on this theory relative to the others is the participation of the work of the church in that reconciling work that's begun in Christ is a work that continues in and through the through the church and those examples that he presented kind of can illustrate that um, which has me thinking a lot about the confession of 1967 that is all about reconciliation and um, you know between people and um, the, the reconciling work of Christ. Uh, which again, I should have brought a copy of the, the Confessions yeah. up. But anyway, that 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 stood out to me. I think in a little bit more. And yet, it's it is interesting to find. I think you're, maybe to your point, as I hear it, is trying to find you know like a handhold in there like how on the one hand it seems that there's an active participation on the other hand it's sort of like how do i start to embrace it i suppose it seems like it's, it's after the salvation that the says jesus bridges the gap and enables us to live in full and you know the reconciliation and all that but it's mm -hmm. after Mm -hmm. 
you know, this author in the study guide said, God is the initiator of reconciliation. But sometimes he uses our relationships with one another to complete that transformation. As in the story of Paul and, how do you say it, Anani, Anani? Ananias? Ananias. 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 Um, well, it seems like the, the, the common thread for our role, whether you read it in Romans, Ephesians, or any of the letters, is faith. I mean, that's our engagement in the whole thing, isn't it? Because uh, if we're shut off, uh, does it exist? I mean, I, I, I struggle with that because it's like, how do you know if you're saved? I mean, you know, it's not like all of a sudden there's a halo, <laughs> for example. Um, but um, but it's, it, I mean, faith is our should be our response. I, would, I mean, I don't know, maybe response isn't the word, but faith is sort of the conduit, it seems, that makes us receptive to the grace that is available to us. You're absolutely right. And I didn't mean to say, you know, we do it by works. We can't. No. It's impossible. It's not within our power. It's only by God's grace. But we have to meet him through faith, I think. So the author points out that reconciliation atonement is easy to relate to, especially for those who feel alienated from God or estranged from someone else. And it may also be relevant to the divisiveness found throughout our society today. Critics of the theory say God has never really left us and we are never fully outside the reach of God's love. And then it says the concept of prevenient grace, I've never heard that word before, prevenient grace, is that God is at work in us before we even know it. So how does Romans 5, 8 speak to this? How does that work in us before we even know it? What does Romans 5 say? It says, but God proves uh, his love for us in that while we uh, still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely than now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him uh, from the wrath of God? That was also a nine, sorry. Can you look back on it in your life? and see evidence that the Lord was at work in your life before you even knew it? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I feel like that's often maybe the case as we, as, we, as we think about it, you know, things that might seem kind of random and you wonder how they, you know, how they, how they come together in a particular fashion. Um, you know, before you fully recognize you know, this. Um, you know, maybe in a biblical example, why did why did Jesus pick Peter's boat to go out and preach from? You know, and then um, then calling Peter and so on. You know, the, there's things that were happening. I think, you know, in him before, maybe it was his brother. His brother had some interest. He heard about Jesus a little bit through his brother or something. I mean, there's some, all kinds of different different ways that, you know, it didn't begin when Peter decided to drop his nets and follow Jesus. It began, I guess, it began before that. Yeah, and so the as in the story of Saul and Ananias, when we are faithful to go where the Lord leads us, even in our doubts and concerns, we can see the Lord do amazing things. And we see that no person is outside the reach of God's love. God calls us to be reconcilers in our communities, in our individual lives, and in our churches. So then there was that story about C.P. Ellis and Ann Atwater and how their unlikely relationship had a massive impact on racism in their community. 
So I think, you know, setting aside maybe the conundrum of what, what is our part in reconciliation with God, the author is now asking us to look at our role in reconciliation in our relationships our, here now on earth and in our communities and in our church. So there's a question in the book, page 80. Are you open to being used by God in surprising ways or through unlikely relationships? Sometimes, <laughs> it all depends. <laughs> For me, it's hard to know. It's hard to know God's will for me. Like things happen in my life and, and I have responses to them, but I'm not always sure, am I doing God's will? Am I doing my will? Are there any suggestions on how to know the difference? Does anybody else struggle with that? No. <laughs> no. 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 Earlier we had we had talked about um, or someone had said something about using other faiths and um, traditions. When um, my ex husband and I uh, moved to Utah, you know, there to be Presbyterian, then to be a Presbyterian post pastor in, in Utah. Um, I was warned a lot about the Jesus Christ of love and say people and that they are a cult, uh, that there's nothing good with them. Um, and for me, um, I found many they have some odd traditions, but then again, we have some odd traditions as well. Um, you know, they do the baptism of the, the dead to try and bring people to um, faith. We celebrate communion, eating the body and you know, drinking the blood of Christ. Those are kind of odd things. Um, I there um, I found we moved from New Jersey to um, Utah and it was not cool for my kids to be with their parents. It was you know there was not really any ac action uh, engagement that I could have with my kids. I moved to Utah and you know, my son at that time was in baseball and they said, um, you know, we want our daughter to be with us in New Jersey. Like, oh man, you really have to go spend time with your family and your brother at, at games. What, what, what? That's stupid. We go to Utah and it's, oh, okay, we'll see you afterwards. So they were that family, even, you know, kids in early high school were supporting that. And that on the other hand, um, we weren't part of them. We weren't, we didn't have the same faith tradition as they did. And my son was, 11, which is when they they start joining the the priesthood of the um, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint Church. So they would ask him, what ward are you part of? That was his, so that they would know who he was. And his response was always, I'm part of the Presbyterian ward. <laughs> And the kids are like, huh? Oh. They go home and but I guess what I'm trying to say is that that there's value in other people's faith traditions and how they see things. And um, 
I just have, I'm, I'm having difficulty in us only focusing on Christ being the only way for everyone to get to where we all want to be, which is, so that's, that's where I'm having, I'm, I'm just struggling with that. I believe that's right for me, but I, I have trouble when we start talking about that, putting it in frame where, where it is the only way that we can be there. Because we were also in you know, an Orthodox Jewish community in back in New Jersey. And <coughs> It's just it's just a challenge for me to to read these things and and for <coughs> comments and and questions to be about society as a whole, not about what our own personal. I'm sorry, I just went off, but um, yeah. I'm sure you're anxious. It's all very good. I, I've pretty much given up trying to figure out how far it works. The only certainty really that I think I have anymore is that God has work. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing. <coughs> and I, I just don't get it, <laughs> how it all works. <laughs> but it does. And I mean, and, and I'm seeing God working in some surprising ways um, just with my nephew. Um, Oh, he's reading the Bible. <laughs> Who knew? And thinks everybody should do it. And thinks, yeah. And he's finding it kind of fascinating what the founder means. It's mentioned in talks, but I wish I could have been more directed than I'm just saying, Jack. I don't know how this works, but you know, God is a word. What can I say? We don't have to have all those answers, right? Well, I mean, a couple would be nice. Sit <laughs> <laughs> around, stand too long. One, <laughs> one of the most other, we need another talk, stand. <laughs> one of the most shocking things I ever heard from a, a pastor was actually Pastor Wendy Clark say she had a friend who. Um, didn't come around to the Bible, but initially, and said, well, you know, the problem is, is it's incomplete. The Bible is incomplete. It doesn't answer everything. And her response was, he was right. And of course, that just, bah, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, when Jesus was telling his parables and the, the, he got with the disciple and the disciples going, why are you saying that? That's confusing. He says, because I'm saying these things so that people with ears to hear can hear it. And the other thing that's noteworthy is when God started this grand plan, it was intended for two people, as far as we knew. And then that kind of fizzled. And then along comes Abram. And he decides, you're going to father a... a a, a, a race, a, a, a creed that will be recipient of my promise. That's all we knew at that time in history. And they received it. And then along comes Christ and, and does this thing. And then we learn through Paul, and there's glimpses of it earlier in the Bible, but we learn through Paul that there's a bigger secret here. It's going to be available to everyone, the Gentiles included. And even at that time in the early church, there were places where the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go there. And of course they went there and bad things happened. Um, you know, like Asia Minor, I think was one of them that they were supposed to avoid, but now it's worldwide. So this has been, an, it's like, it's almost universal in its, in its expansion. And I have to watch the language there because I know there's, there's some folks that do think that it's, that grace is, will affect everyone and will include everyone and you know there's that may run in a foul of some scripture but it's one of those things we don't know and the one thing that i draw from all this is it's like a diamond that you can only look at one 
fascia of the diamond at one time. There's all these different aspects to it. But what about the, 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 the God of the, the Old Testament? It's still the same God. He's still capable of anger. He just found a way to temper it. Um, <laughs> well, he did. He found, he says, it, it, you know, I set a law. It was violated. This is how we'll, we'll handle things through that law. And in doing so, we'll relieve the burden of the law from the chosen ones who accept it by faith. And that's grace. So I don't know, um, but I, but I think Vicky's absolutely right. We can't possibly know all this, and we sure can't think of it at one time. It isn't, and that's very difficult for us. It's difficult for me. If we knew it all, then we'd be God. <laughs> right? Exactly, and yeah. that's that's what I think uh, makes you feel humble. Mm -hmm. that you don't know it all, but you're still called to keep working at it. And some people give up. They don't want to work at it. They just want to accept it, and they don't want to struggle with it. And that, I think, they don't have the right path. They're, they're, they're not on the right path. There's no question, no doubting. I think God keeps asking us to struggle with the issue. Keep asking the question. That's good news. <laughs> <laughs> because I think God is, God uh, is, you know, the Old Testament and then the God of the New Testament and God of the now. He is at work. He, he is changing people. Right now. So, to kind of close up, on um, page 82 <laughs> in our book, <laughs> such a deep discussion. Um, at the top of 82, the author says, that is our calling as the church to be God's antidote to tribalism. Even though our default human condition is to categorize people into manageable ideological and sociological boxes, God calls us to live into the vision of Ephesians to make an effort to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. And on the last page, 83, in the second to last paragraph, I underlined this a little bit. Um, what a burden, burdensome privilege it is to be the church. <laughs> And then the last bit, we have been reconciled to God through Christ. And in Christ, God is reconciling us with each other. The only thing we need to do is surrender to it. And then help make it happen. <laughs> so our whole, our whole paradox is right there in that last sentence. <clears throat> Any final thoughts today? And I can help in this chapter to wonder simply by, by being the church, if that in itself doesn't present barriers to others. The Bible calls us to not forsake gathering up. The minute we gather up, we kind of created a box for ourselves. Right mm -hmm. And while we may not feel like we're putting up the barriers, certainly the barrier is perceived by other people looking in. And that brings me to kind of think how different the ministry of Jesus was, which wasn't bound in a specific gathering. <laughs> so we need each other and we need the fellowship, but that apparently can't be the end all if we're serious about being reconciled with others.
exclusively. It seems to me, I don't know what it's like about the PDP. It's like we walk in the door and we <clears throat> speak a different language to the outside world. And nobody really knows what the dialect is or how to pronounce the words. And I don't think we do a very good job in removing that or all of us learning the same language and being aware of people that come in that don't know that language. And even people we talk to on the streets or in our homes, but, but we are set aside, that's for sure. Yeah. And I'd be the first to admit that, you know, I love the fellowship. I love the box. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. part of that I believe isn't our fault. I think a lot of that's driven by the devil. He's going to use very creative means to say, oh, those guys are crazy. Look at them. They use their own vernacular, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's the human nature, you know, like we just discussed to categorize, identify, and exclude. The part of the church we longed for was interesting, too. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of things in there, you know, works outside the walls. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. balance is confidence and humility changes as needed right? is not satisfying <laughs> yeah I thought that would be a whole other discussion <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a big one. I think his statement about sin being evil I can't exactly agree with that but I think sin is waywardness you know we go a different path Mm -hmm. So, this is one of those things that happens. I do, I do like that last bit though that she wrote about the church, the church we long for. Would it be okay that we, if we go around the room and have people read the words? Because some of them, we've been, one of them is always asking questions. That's exactly what we've been doing today. Mm -hmm. I think that's really something the church hasn't always done or allowed us to do. But I don't know if anybody else would like to read those things. Well, how about if we start with that next time? Is we're ready to read that? Okay. You want to start with that next time? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's great. I, didn't, I can't see the clock. So oh, okay. Okay. We got to get going. All right. Let's pray. God, we praise you for claiming us to live in sweet fellowship with you. May we be the sweet aroma of the gospel to those in our families, our communities, and our churches, loving them the way you have loved us. In Jesus' name. Amen.